G'day from Jarrah people's country, which sits so patiently beneath the shallow surface of the colonial state of Victoria, awaiting reclamation. Well, do we have a compost for you? If you haven't already subscribed to our non-data mining website, please feel free to pause this video and do so now. Head to artistersfamily.is and click on the subscribe tab. In previous videos, we have referred to scientific literature that indicates COVID deaths under the age of 80 are largely the result of vitamin D deficiency and overweight populations. We referred to this work, COVID-19 mortality risk correlates inversely with vitamin D status and a mortality rate close to zero could theoretically be achieved at 50 nanograms per milliliter. In this review and meta-analysis, the authors conclude, current data clearly show that vaccination alone cannot prevent SARS-CoV-2 infections and dissemination of the virus. This scenario possibly will become much worse in the case of new virus mutations that are not very susceptible to the current vaccines or even not sensitive to any vaccine. Although there exists very broad database support for the protective effect of vitamin D against severe SARS-CoV-2 infections, we strongly recommend initiating well-designed observational studies and or double-blind randomised control trials to convince the medical community and the health authorities that vitamin D testing and supplementation are needed to avoid fatal breakthrough infections and to be prepared for new dangerous mutations. We also referred to this correspondence in the British Medical Journal, COVID-19, highest death rate seen in countries with most overweight populations, which stated COVID-19 death rates are 10 times higher in countries where more than half of the adult population is classified as overweight, a comprehensive report from the World Obesity Federation has found. The report, COVID-19 and Obesity, the cost of not addressing the global obesity crisis, summarizes the findings as such. Through detailed analyses of the latest peer-reviewed data, we demonstrate how being overweight is a highly significant predictor of developing complications from COVID-19 including the need for hospitalization, for intensive care, and for mechanical ventilation. Overweight is also a predictor of death from COVID-19. In other videos, we've criticized state lockdown measures involving, on the one hand, the closing down of children's playgrounds, places where children, their parents and carers can be outside in fresh air, exercising, and potentially receiving natural forms of vitamin D through sunlight while on the other hand, enabling bottle shops and fast food outlets to remain open, selling products that knowingly harm the immune system and that contribute to the cardiovascular disease crisis. In September of this year, we published our COVID roadmap, neo-peasant style. This is what we wrote. Number one, cease the coercive, dangerous and violent mandating of novel therapeutics, COVID vaccines. Two introduce diverse voices into COVID public discourse, including indigenous thinkers, community elders, broad thinking generalists, creative ecologists, and others who understand a pandemic is more like a forest in its complexity, rather than a factory of cogs, bolts, and shifting spanners. Number three, offer people COVID antibody serological tests to observe levels of natural immunity in the population until herd immunity is reached naturally. Promote immune enhancing life ways, including whole foods, home garden food, daily exercise, meaningful work, meditation, etc. And make these life ways available to everyone through a systematic societal deconstruction of the capitalist property market. Having access to stable housing and land is a basic human need and improves immunity by reducing financial stress. Four, make widely available COVID treatment therapies that have long been studied and are not a risk to public health. Many of these treatments have been targets of smear campaigns. Investigate who is behind the smearing and expose their interests. Number five, conduct an inquiry into why the federal government agreed to indemnify COVID-19 vaccine manufacturers, thus putting vaccine injury costs onto the Australian public. Investigate the silencing of doctors through the directive issued by the Medical Board of Australia and the Australian Health Practitioner Regulatory Agency, which states, 
doctors may not produce statements or health advice which undermine the national immunisation campaign, including via social media. 6. Expose the pharmaceutical industry's criminal track record. Enable people in their communities to understand the economic drivers of this industry's criminality and overrule legal immunity of the manufacturers of COVID vaccines in relation to people who are injured by them. Number seven, cease the segregation tactics at all levels of government and critically examine the societal scapegoating that has taken place. Engage in community-wide grief circles for those who have either been misled and or scapegoated throughout this pandemic to help restore harmony in communities. Eight, cease the lockdowns, cancel the state of emergency and give financial and medical support to people in crisis. Number nine, inform people of the true story of the origins of COVID. We recognise many may not be ready for this one, but nonetheless, it looks most likely it began as a human engineered virus leaked from the Wuhan Institute of Virology by scientists working on behalf of the vaccine industry and funded by America's NIH. Enable communities around the world to decide whether gain of function research should be conducted or not. 10. Work to dismantle corporate government collusion generally in society and immediately close the revolving door between government, officials and the pharmaceutical industry. Number 11. Switch off state-funded and corporatised media and support independent media channels, platforms and news agencies that declare their interests. Revoke any government bills or policy that harm the functioning of investigative journalism and a healthy fourth estate. Free Assange. 12. Rebuild the public's trust in government by electing only candidates who commit to fully disabling lobbying of political parties by business, roll back corporate interference in public institutions, especially in health and education, and restore democratic principles in all tiers of government. Number 13, demilitarize the police force, wind back their excessive weapons and power, and enable peaceful protests. Collectively grieve what and who we have lost over the past 18 months and praise all we have gained. We felt at the time, and still do, this was a fair roadmap. To give a little more context for it, to turn the compost as it were, we refer again to the Australian Government's health website, which quotes, the median age for COVID mortality in Australia is 84 years old. Life expectancy in Australia, according to Google, is 82.9. A Sydney University report states there is less than 1% COVID-19 mortality risk for people under 60, and according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, almost 75% of people who die with COVID have chronic comorbidities. On top of this, Omicron came to Australia via two vaccinated people and is now being transmitted throughout the country by mostly fully vaccinated people. So in other words, it's a bit vaccine resistant and antibody resistant. And the combination of those two factors, you don't need it to be terribly transmissible if it's got a bit of vaccine or antibody resistance as well. So then the, the population behaves as though it's a new virus and therefore it spreads through the, the population very quickly and looks as if it's a highly contagious virus when it's actually not. It's more the vaccine resistance that's doing that. As we investigated in our last video, Transmission of SARS-CoV-2 is spread by both vaccinated and unvaccinated people alike. Furthermore, many COVID comorbidities belong to a much more serious pandemic of cardiovascular disease caused by cigarettes, alcohol, physical inactivity and junk food that according to the WHO kills nearly 18 million people globally each year, which is about eight times more deaths annually than COVID deaths. So, Given all these additions to the unfolding COVID story compost, has the official response to the pandemic been proportional or even logical? If you are anti-mandate, you are absolutely anti-vax. I don't care what your personal vaccination status is. If you support, champion, give a green light, give comfort to, support anybody who argues against the vaccine, you are an anti-vaxxer. They're killing people. I mean, it really, they really, look, the only pandemic we have is among the unvaccinated. And, that, and, they're, and they're killing people. And I wouldn't want the, the appalling, the disgusting, and the potentially 
criminal behaviour of a small number of people to detract away from the amazing job that so many Victorians have done. It is so unfair for a small, ugly mob to be taking attention away from the more than 90 per cent of Victorians who have had a first dose and will soon have had a second dose. So you basically said this is going to be like, well, it's almost like I, you probably don't see it like this, the two different classes of people. If you're vaccinated or if you're unvaccinated, you have all these rights. If you are vaccinated... That is what it is. So, yep. Yeah. Yep. And I don't think that ordinary, hard-working, uh, mainstream Victorians, those who are not ugly extremists, it's not reflective of what the vast, vast, more than nine in ten Victorians have done an amazing thing. This frightening fundamentalist faith in a one-size-fits-all big pharma fix needs to be critically examined as such abuse by politicians has given people permission to be discriminatory and has divided communities and families. There is a COVID exacerbated mental health crisis in Australia, especially in the state of Victoria, who hosted the world's harshest lockdowns. The government has never done a cost-benefit analysis of the whole pandemic story. And despite over 90% of Victorians now fully vaccinated, there are soaring case numbers. Yes, in this very moment, ICUs host mostly unvaccinated people with chronic comorbidities. But as we know from other countries, further along the COVID story, this is all about to change. If governments allow doctors to administer early treatments using known and harmless drugs, these numbers would be radically diminished. Everyone we know who has had COVID used a combination of zinc, quercetin, megadose vitamin C, vitamin D and ivermectin. They all recovered quickly and they now have natural immunity to COVID. None had to go into hospital. The amount of people we know, especially young people, who have vaccine injuries is alarming and we know there is an enormous cover-up story that is pushing itself up through the cracks of the political concrete. Furthermore, it is deeply concerning, given the permanent pandemic bill which has just passed in Victoria that gives the Premier unprecedented powers, that the Centre for National Resilience in Melbourne is about to open. Although the guise of this centre was for quarantining overseas visitors, a report in the Age newspaper back in October stated that while most travellers will avoid it, the quarantine camp is likely to still have a use for unvaccinated people. You would think this would be big news. A $200 million federally funded, state-run centre for non-compliers. According to the Builder Multiplex, this internment camp, let's call it what it is, features cells for singles, couples and families, and part of the schedule of works includes the provision of internal cages. Huh, to house the chickens in a permaculture designed garden? More seriously, if we disappear from presenting these updates, you'll know where to find us. In Victoria, thanks to the man who calls those who don't comply ugly extremists, we now have permanent pandemic orders in place and an internment camp about to open for non-compliers. In 2020, before vaccines dominated the COVID story, our community was tight. So many of us were focused on helping one another and strengthening community immunity and economy. Now, because of the imperatives of big pharma and fundamentalist governments, our communities have never been so divided. Yet there is much hope. As the vaccines continue to fail in stopping transmission, we now have the opportunity to focus on obtaining natural herd immunity and finally put this pandemic to rest. More evidence from Israel concludes natural immunity is, surprise, surprise, far superior to narrow and fleeting vaccine immunity. The authors write, This study demonstrated that natural immunity confers longer lasting and stronger protection against infection, symptomatic disease and hospitalisation caused by the Delta variant of SARS-CoV-2 compared to the Pfizer two-dose vaccine-induced immunity. The politicising of natural immunity has been a conspicuous phenomenon throughout this pandemic and an almost religious-like belief in novel therapeutics has emerged. Vaccine, 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 vaccine I'm begging of you, please don't hesitate Whatever happened to the precautionary principle? 
Protect our whole community. Let's lock down herd immunity. Huh? Lock down herd immunity? It's a catchy song, and we're sure they are all well-intentioned folk, but blind faith can grow monsters on any side of a political debate. We don't discriminate whether you are on the left or right of politics. We will not dehumanise you for being on another team. Lobbying has polluted the political process and people are rightly sceptical of the interference of big business in all aspects of life, especially politics. We cannot underestimate the level of coercion and manipulation occurring in and by government. Be you vaccine free, one shot jabbed, two shot or three, can we put aside our differences and fight political corruption? Can we come together to focus our attention on overthrowing the government power mongers and corporatists who pollute every cell of political and institutional life? Will we accept a permanent social credit reward system that manipulates our conduct, discourages us from critiquing governments or attending protests and deters us from speaking up and speaking out? What really matters now is not the vaccine for or vaccine free binary, but the democracy we are so evidently losing, strip mined for an idea about health that is monological and money centric. Throughout this video, we have outlined the response to COVID from our neo peasant, earth centered, mythological sensibilities. Treat poor diet, unhealthy life ways, and vitamin D deficiency, reject divisive politics that harm communities and enable universal access to land. This response comes from a more general acceptance that a reductive GMO mRNA response to food and medicine will never compete with the complexity of a much more than human, integrative, ecological microbiome approach. Numerous others, more knowledgeable, have spoken about preventative and early treatment protocols, so we won't go into that now. But there is another important COVID treatment rarely discussed something we've sorely lost in this culture of make-believe, that is, a relationship with our mortality. Our culture seduces us to believe we can live forever, and we've lost a broad-based eldership that says this idea is phony and destructive. This is not to apportion blame to any one person or group. Rather, it has come about by generational ringleaders, industrialists of material shallowness, who have sold us the delusion that we don't have to face our mortality and develop an intimacy with it. Every truly sustainable culture on earth has a healthy relationship with death and mortality is keenly connected to ritual and rites of passage. A safety first ideology instead of a safety fourth cosmology synonymous with mature cultures is yet another comorbidity that is harming people in diverse ways in this pandemic. Well, that's the wrap for the week. If you'd like to support our work, please click the support tab on our website. Thank you so much to those who gave last week. Much love to you all, including our fiercest critics. <laughs>